Hello, everybody. Welcome to Contagion, Capitalism, and Resistance. This is a panel brought to you by PM Press, alongside Between the Lines, Verso, A Radical Guide, and Melville House. Uh, my name is Timothy Faust. It's nice to see all of you um, online. I wish I could. Uh, typically, we'd start with a land acknowledgement. That's a little bit trickier since we're all online. But rest assured, wherever you're watching us from, you're watching it on indigenous land. So we want to acknowledge and respect those indigenous peoples today. We're here to talk about the coronavirus, COVID-19, and resistance. Now, this is not the first epidemic to rock America, but only the most recent. And there's plenty to learn from the movements which responded to crises like these in the past. We're here to ask, what can we learn from past activist responses to health crises? And how do we protect vulnerable communities while we build resistance movements during COVID-19? Let me start with a panel like this. I'm a healthcare writer. I talk to people about healthcare inequity, health injustice in their own homes. Healthcare is a local affair. Healthcare needs are localized, uh, how they shake out is specific to your state, your county, and your community. In America, it's not a crime to be poor, and it's not a crime to be black, not a crime to be sick. Well, once you follow the, the intersection of those categories, the rules change. See, coronavirus is a big exacerbator. It takes existing power dynamics and douses them in gasoline. People who are already being punished for being sick, or punished for being poor, or punished for being black, or brown, or indigenous, are seeing their suffering compounded. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that black communities are disproportionately bearing the brunt of COVID deaths, just like it's not a coincidence that the workers most exposed during a pandemic happen to be some of the lowest paid, just like it's not a coincidence that social distancing in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods are being policed differently, just like it's a, not a coincidence that black children die at much higher rates than white children, just like it's not a coincidence that poor men have life expectancies 15 years shorter than those of rich men. COVID is just tracing and retracing the boundaries of health and justice in America, which sucks big time. Makes you feel small and afraid and by the nature of a response to it, isolates. But it's not the first epidemic in America. It's not the first plague on earth. It has predecessors. And by studying those predecessors and how they exacerbated or, or were exacerbated the power relations with capitalism, we can start to put together an idea of what we do now. So that's why we brought together these panelists to try to illuminate the struggle of today and the fight for tomorrow. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce them. First up is Dr. Omishure H. Dryden, who was the James R. Johnston Chair in Black Canadian Studies and the Faculty of Medicine and Associate Professor of Community Health and Epidemiology at Dalhousie University. Dr. Dryden is an interdisciplinary scholar who examines the symbolics of blood and the social link of blood donation while engaging in Black queer diasporic analysis and health and medical humanities. Dr. Dryden is the principal investigator of hashtag Got Blood to Give, or in French, I hope, uh, do, do Sa Doni, a research project which seeks to identify the barriers African and Black, gay, bisexual, and trans men encounter with donating blood and also analyzes how anti-Black racism, colonialism, and sexual exceptionalism shapes the blood systems in Canada. Dr. Dryden has been published in peer-reviewed journals and book collections and has an edited collection with Dr. Suzanne Lennon called Disrupting Queer Inclusion, Canadian Homonationalisms, and the Politics of Belonging. Dr. Dryden is an associate scientist with the Maritime SPOR Support Unit. She's a current member of the International Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective, and in 2019 became co-president of the Black Canadian Studies Association. She's here representing her book, Disrupting Queer Inclusion, Canadian Homo Nationalisms, and the Politics of Belonging, put out by UBC Press. Hello, Dr. Sorry, Dryden. Hello, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good, you as well. Uh, so thank you uh, for including me in this. Uh, so I just have a few notes. I'm hoping, uh, I'm excited to get to the conversation. So I'm just going to offer some insights. <clears throat> I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the traditional unceded territories of um, the Maliseet, along with Mi'kma'ki people. Uh, I named this because I think it's important to also acknowledge African Nova Scotian communities um, and the ways in which African Nova Scotian communities have also been um, uh, displaced and marginalized within this colonial setting. So black studies in medical education and public health include the interrogations of parameters of what makes someone healthy and the system of healthcare in which we exist. And it's important to look at the, this myth of um, a racist free field and how uh, that myth uh, perpetuates and can be deadly for many of us. I think about the work of um, some scholars, uh, theorists, 
who have argued that when we look at the field of epidemiology, which is getting a, a lot of focus right now, especially in mapping and um, uh, modeling in terms of what's happening with COVID, when we think about ep epidemiology, um, we need to look at the ways in which outbreaks and epidemics are communicated. Um, and the, the routes of transmission and how these are made visible um, and how this visibility provides guidance or the, uh, provides uh, uh, misguidance, if you will. <laughs> and uh, when we think about the ways in which uh, COVID is articulated and the ways that pandemics are articulated, then what epidemi epidemiology offers us, so what we need to understand about epidemiology is that it's also a technology, it's a narrative technology, much like the microscope, um, and it's used to delineate the membership and the scale of a population. So we hear a lot about population studies, but as you said, Timothy, not all of us are, are considered members of the population. And so this is one of the reasons why we also need to be critical and cautious around the data and the information that comes out of epidemiology. As others have stated, um, and we'll talk about today, population rarely includes BIPOC folks, including LGBTQS folks. Um, and it's really important to see how whiteness operates as a measure of respectability that seeks to further antagonize and rupture potential communities of care. Collectively, Black people in Canada find themselves amongst the most disadvantaged uh, in all indicators of what is considered a good, health-filled life. So belonging, we find, takes a biological turn through outbreaks and epidemics. And in most in pandemics, we see the circulation of language, as I said, images and storylines, which are used to document the unconventional into the conventional. So when something new happens, there's an attempt to make sense of it by investing within familiar narratives. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we, when we hear from premiers, um, governors, uh, public health, chief public health officers, the narrative that they strike around uh, COVID often dictates to us who they are caring about and who, who was an afterthought, which populations were an afterthought. So public health has often been launched, uh, public health and policing work together, and these have been launched against Black communities. I was talking about this with colleagues, Beverly Bain and Ronaldo Walken, in an article we just published in The Conversation, where both public health and policing depends on assessing Black people as wayward. So public health has historically been an extension of policing for Black people, which positions us not only as suspicious, um, in terms of where, why we're in certain spaces, but as vectors and carriers that, um, that are often <clears throat> disproportionately um, targeted by police and public health officials. Um, so I, I wanted to say that as just a suggestion, um, uh, as an offering, but I also wanted to talk about the ways in which um, communities have been responding. So here in Nova Scotia, African Nova Scotian communities, and I guess and I, I mentioned them a bit at the beginning, African Nova Scotian communities have come together to establish COVID response teams in community settings as a way to support one another, to make sure they're supporting elderly folks, um, youth, and also as a group to work collaboratively to advocate with, um, uh, sometimes against, uh, the province and decision makers as a way to push them towards uh, appropriately responding to marginal communities and specifically African Nova Scotian communities. Um, Black scholars and uh, journalists in Nova Scotia have been writing op-ed pieces, have been really pushing the conversation to make sure that the marginalization and the harms that have been perpetrated against Black people um, are, are getting some airtime. And then uh, Black people in Nova Scotia, African Nova Scotians, have set up cop watch, uh, an online cop watch as a way to respond to how the state attempts to police the pandemic and how the policing of the pandemic um, works often to our own disadvantage. So I'll start with that. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dryden. Really appreciate that. Um, next up is Gary Kinsman. 
Gary Kinsman was one of the first three employees of the AIDS Committee of Toronto, a member of AIDS Action Now, the Newfoundland AIDS Association, the Valley AIDS Concern Group in Nova Scotia, and now the AIDS Activist History Project. He is currently involved in the policing of the pandemic. He is also the author of The Regulation of Desire, co-author of The Canadian War on Queers, and a contributor to the upcoming essay collection, Sick of the System, Between the Lines, or Sick of the System, published by Between the Lines. His website is radicalnoise.ca. Again, Mr. Kinsman's here representing the book, Sick of the System, Why the COVID-19 Recovery Must Be Revolutionary, published by Between the Lines. Mr. Kinsman, uh, thanks for coming to join us. Hi, everyone. Um, this is one of the books that I've published. Um, you might be interested in the Canadian War on Queers. Um, I'm speaking to you from the territories of the Atikamishing Anishinaabek Nation and other Anishinaabek people, um, sometimes referred to as Sudbury, Ontario in Canada. The chapter in Sick of the System that I'm referring to um, here is on the lessons or, or what we can learn from AIDS activism and how we can then use those acquisitions to respond better uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sick of the System will be coming out this coming Monday as an ebook from Between the Lines and will be on the basis of Pay What You Can. So without going into a lot of detail, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of points um, in these introductory remarks and hopefully we can get into more discussion in uh, the question and answer period. Um, I wanna build on what Omi Sheree just said about the critique of public health because one of the acquisitions that comes out of AIDS activism is a critique of public health. We always need to ask which public is being protected and defended and whose health is being protected and defended. In the context of the AIDS crisis, it's important to remember the public was constructed as being white, heterosexual and middle class. And those people who were excluded from that public included men who had sex with men, Haitians and other people of color, included, including the racist construction of African AIDS, drug users, sex workers and other groups. All of those groups had discrimination um, and stigmatization organized against them. Just like in the context of COVID-19, uh, people who are identified as being of Asian descent have had violence, harassment and stigmatization organized against them. So it's really important for us to ask critical questions about public health. And I think too much of the mainstream left just accepts public health as common sense. And we really need to be far more critical than that. Now in the current context of COVID-19, certain groups of people are also being defined as expendable. There were years during which no action was taken around AIDS and HIV because it was only considered to be a, affecting the expendable populations that I just mentioned. Right now, under the conceptualizations of herd immunity, and now with the mobilization by the right wing and sections of the capitalist class of reopening the economy, certain groups of people are being explicitly and implicitly defined as being expendable. That includes older people, and we're all aware of the horror stories in long-term care facilities. It includes people with immune compromised situations. It includes black and indigenous populations. It includes many precarious workers. We need to argue in response that none of these groups of people are expendable, no life is expendable, and we need to mobilize in very different ways. Now, there's specific problems with aspects of public health that I'm not going to go into in these introductory remarks besides mentioning problems with the notion of social distancing, problems with stay at home, problems with everyone should be washing their hands all the time when many people don't have access to water and, or clean water, lots of problems there. I also want to highlight the global dimensions of the COVID-19 crisis. And in the context of the AIDS crisis, we argued quite actively for the need to transfer resources to countries in the global south if AIDS was actually going to be addressed. Right now, we need to argue quite strongly for the cancelization, cancellation of the global debt that many countries in the global south face. And we also need to argue for the transfer of resources uh, to the global south. I want to spend my remaining time talking about uh, the impact of this on our movements and struggles. They are attempting to use um, the global pandemic uh, to decompose the struggles that we were all engaged in prior to the initiation of the global pandemic. And it's really important for us to understand that that is part of their project. Perhaps it's most clear in relationship to some indigenous struggles, and this is happening globally, where resource extraction capitalism is being defined as essential, and all of those projects are being pushed rapidly ahead 
in a situation in which they endanger indigenous people's health, but also in which it's, it's far more difficult for indigenous people and their allies to respond effectively uh, to these campaigns. And I think that's important for us to recognize. But more hopefully, I think we also have to see that there's a recomposition of forms of struggle. I think Omi Shire was just talking about some of these in the Nova Scotian context. And this is important to both keep alive what we learned from our movements before COVID-19, but also what we're learning right now. This includes the transformation, the modification of more traditional forms of struggle, including strikes, wildcats, walkouts, hunger strikes, like the successful hunger strike that occurred just outside Montreal of people in the Laval detention facility, which led to many of those people being released from the Laval detention facility. It includes what happened in Toronto, Ontario yesterday, where people, um, anti-poverty activists and other activists for basically formed a blockade with physical distancing uh, to prevent um, a tent city encampment of homeless people from being taken down by the city. There's new forms of struggles, car cavalcades, car blockades, an explosion of the use of social media with all of its limitations. But I also want to stress the development of mutual aid and social solidarity networks that are once again emphasizing um, caring labor, social reproduction labor, which has to be at the heart of how we build new forms of life after uh, the COVID-19 um, endemic is over. We need to be preparing for when we can return to the streets in massive numbers, when we can organize in relationship to direct democracy and direct action, once again, in a, a more effective way. We need to be planning our response to their attempts to impose deep levels of austerity on us after the COVID-19 crisis is over. And we need to not get trapped simply within defensive struggles, defending what we had before. We need to be more radical, more, more far reaching in terms of how we go. We need to move on to the offensive with what we've learned from surviving the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And that includes the need to organize against capitalism, against all forms of oppression and for life. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for, for hearing me and hopefully we'll have a great discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Kinsman. That was fantastic. Seeing lots of snaps and claps in the other uh, presenters' video feeds. Um, our third panelist is L.A. Kaufman. L.A. Kaufman has spent more than 30 years immersed in radical movements as a participant, strategist, journalist, and observer. She's been called a virtuoso organizer by journalist Scott Sherman for her role in saving community gardens and public libraries in New York City from development. Kaufman coordinated the, grass, the grassroots mobilizing efforts for the huge protests against the Iraq War in 2003 and 2004. Her writings on American radicalism and social movements in history have been published in The Nation, N Plus One, The Baffler, and many other outlets. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start uh, by picking up on the land acknowledgement. I'm on Lenape land as, I, as we talk now. And I, as a descendant of European settlers, I can't help but think about how um, the history of this land and the history of pandemics are intertwined. Um, and that the fifth, first 50 European settlements along the East Coast of, of North America were all on villages that were vacated um, because of the spread of disease. Um, so uh, we are um, experiencing um, deep continuities with um, with, with violence and disruption um, and disease on the past. Um, I'm thinking uh, a lot these days about um, ACT UP and the history of AIDS activism, as I think many of us are, um, and thinking about it particularly in the context of the US um, and especially New York where I live. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the critiques that uh, Dr. Dryden um, and uh, Gary Kinsman um, offered of public health um, uh, certainly uh, take me back, uh, you know, uh, you see people sharing information uncritically these days from the CDC, from the FDA, from the NIH, um, as if these um, government institutions were here to protect, were neutral authorities who were here to protect us. 
um, and a, a close look at the history of AIDS activism and many other kinds of, of health-related activism um, show a long history of critique of these institutions um, which have been um, bound up uh, with the profit motive um, and uh, during the Reagan and Bush administrations and again now during the Trump administration um, are of course vehicles for um, a, uh, a particularly uh, vicious uh, vision of public health um, that uh, uh, in this moment is willing to sacrifice some populations at the expense of others and particularly in the interest of profit. Um, when, you know, in, in my book, uh, Direct Action, um, I write a lot about the history of, of ACT UP. Um, I see its work as having been a turning point in the history of the American left over the last, uh, the period since the 1960s. Um, and talk about it as having been the single most effective direct ag action organization of the last 50 years in the, in the US um, since the time of the civil rights movement. Um, uh, but it's important to remember that that's not how it felt to people engaged in that fight for many of the years in which it was going on. And that it took a very, very long time to win some of the crucial life-saving victories that ACT UP won. Um, and I, I say this, um, you know, not to be a wet blanket, but while we're seeing many new forms of struggle emerge, we're seeing important forms of mutual aid emerge, um, the scale of what we're up against um, organizing-wise is enormous. Um, in New York, it's striking that many of the people who are um, working to um, innovate around uh, collective action in some of the ways that Gary Kinsman was talking about um, are exactly, I mean, the same people who were members of ACT UP uh, back in the 80s and the early 90s, as people who survived the pandemic, who are continuing to be key, play key roles in, in uh, what grassroots responses there have been um, in New York in recent weeks, um, groups like Reclaim Pride, Rise and Resist, Vocal New York, Housing Works um, have been um, trying to uh, continue both mutual aid and advocacy works in ways that are, are socially distanced and safe. Um, Reclaim Pride just had its uh, attempted press conference over the weekend completely shut down by the NYPD and the mayor for saying it violated social distancing rules, um, even though other events um, have been going on and people can wait in line at, at you know, Home Depot in Manhattan and Trader Joe's. Um, but the uh, this press conference, um, which is condemning the partnership um, that New York City allowed uh, with Samaritan's Purse, which is a viciously homophobic um, fundamentalist uh, uh, organization that opened a field hospital, a temporary field hospital in Central Park. Um, so that that uh, press conference was completely shut down. You know, it's one of the great ironies of this time in the United States. I mean, the, the, the 18 months after Donald Trump uh, took office uh, in January 1917, in January 2017, witnessed the highest levels of protest participation that we've ever seen in the United States in any comparable period. And, and now we're in a moment where, yes, people are doing these car caravans or they're doing these socially distanced protests, um, but we need to be honest. Um, it's not like when ACT UP went and shut down the FDA or shut down the, 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 the National Institutes of Health with huge numbers of angry queer bodies blockading these institutions in order to demand change. Um, uh, this time, uh, the tools that we have right now, um, it's not clear uh, what impact we're going to be able to have in the short run. And I think people need to really uh, be thinking strategically over the long run. Um, which brings me to my final point, which is um, one of the things when I look back at ACT UP um, and uh, its overall extremely effective uh, history of activism, there was one big gap and it was characteristic of a lot of direct action movements in the US throughout this period. Um, which is, is that it mainly ignored the electoral realm. Um, now, you know, of course they would do things like they would disrupt candidate speeches or have protests outside the convention. I'm not saying ACT UP ign ignored um, the US electoral cycle uh, altogether. Um, but, uh, you know, as many uh, people on the left uh, um, 
ha came to an awakening in the last few years of the importance of new ways of engaging in electoral work for all of its limitations. That's why so many radicals flooded into the Bernie Sanders campaign was the seeing that this could be an important vehicle. And um, in 2020, it's going to be crucial that we find ways to engage in getting Donald Trump voted out of office and in um, getting all of his enablers and collaborators that we can voted out of office. And that's a different political organizing project than the direct action work that ACT UP did um, and that was so important and effective during the AIDS epidemic. Um, so as we are um, thinking creatively about new forms of struggle, we have to think as well about how we engage in old forms of activism, ones that people have found to be impoverished and limited for good reasons, but that are essential and necessary now. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. And I forgot to mention, uh, Ellie Kaufman, I, I get to see everybody's snaps and claps. I wish we could see them. Um, uh, and, and everybody could see them, but unfortunately only I have the camera. It looks at all the panelists. I forgot to mention uh, Ms. Kaufman's book. It's called Direct Action, Protest and the Reinvention of American Radicalism, published by Bursa. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Peter Leinbaugh. Uh, Peter Leinbaugh is a child of empire, schooled in London, Cattaraugus, Washington, D.C., Bonn, and Karachi. He taught at Harvard University in Attica Penitentiary, at New York University in the Federal Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. He used to edit Zero Work and was a member of the Midnight Notes Collective. He's the author of Stop Thief, The London Hanged, The Many-Headed Hydra with Marcus Reddiker, and The Magna Carta Manifesto, and introductions to personal selection of Thomas Paine's writings and PM's new edition of E.P. Thompson's William Morris, Romantic to Revolutionary. He lives in the region of the Great Lakes and works at the University of Toledo in Ohio. And his book, wrote he's representing, is The Incomplete, True, Authentic, and Wonderful History of May Day, published by PM Press. Uh, Dr. Leinbaugh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is the book about May Day. It's uh, incomplete nature, which we added a few more pages just uh, the other day. It's great to hear the news from, uh, from north of uh, the USA border from Canada. And I love hearing from Nova Scotia. I'm an 18th century historian, so the story of the Trelawney Maroo Maroons going to Nova Scotia and then moving on to the most international experience and people of the Atlantic world. That's back in the 18th century. Oh boy, what uh, it's so exciting. And I'm quite honored to be among uh, such activists and, and authors. There's so much to respond to. I do, um, in keeping, want to say that uh, I'm speaking from Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, near to Canada, a part really of a common ecological and historical region of the Potawatomi, the Miami, the Ojibwe, <coughs> uh, who helped us this year at Earth Day and then May Day. So our, and we're thinking of our past in, an, in a new way. How did people live? How did indigenous people live? Before the period that L.A. Kaufman reminded us of, of the massive genocidal pandemics that visited Mexico in the 16th century when 200 million uh, were killed, turning the common lands of arable agriculture of subsistence into ranches for meat farming. That's Mexico, you know, in the 16th century. And then for what's called New England now, and you know, part of the Northeast so-called USA, <clears throat> where May Day started, you know, in, in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1627, the first Maypole was put up with indigenous people, with uh, riffraff from England, with African-American people. That's 1627, that's May Day. 
Most of us know the Haymarket story. But there were so few indigenous people because already the invaders had been preceded by measles, by germs, which made the way for the settler invasion of Massachusetts. I put up and mentioned that this other book uh, by a conservative historian, uh, William McNeil, called Plagues and Peoples, because I think it has an important methodological assumption in it, which I want to, uh, you know, put on the table, which, and it's, uh, I think, really necessary for epidemiologists <clears throat> as it is for, for everyone, to understand that he's, he refers to microparasites and also to macroparasites. And he looks through human history that we know of and the development of Im immune, immune systems and the transmission and development of pathogens he looks at them <clears throat> both in terms of microbiology, but also in terms of social classes, in terms of microparasites. And I think this is essential for us to understand that we're not speaking of a, like a human nature or we're all humans of different sorts, but to understand that there are some humans who profit off of others and that this is essential to understanding the transmission of diseases. So there's a place where exploitation and, and disease overlap. And this, of course, to ref L.A. Kaufman <laughs> asked us to take a long view, and I'm not sure she had in mind one of millennia, but I think more of us are thinking in millennial terms because of the crisis on the planet. And the crisis on the planet of planetary warming of the sixth extinction, uh, this is also directly associated with the origins of new diseases. And we can anticipate, you know, more and more such uh, surprises. And in fact, uh, this book by this conservative guy out of Chicago. I mean, usually we think of the Chicago school as being monetarists and the founders of neoliberalism. But this McNeil, he shows us that pandemics and the oscillations of them and the changes of uh, demograph demograph demography through human history, these are directly related to the economic processes by which exploitation takes place. Now, my own interest as a historian, well, first of all, I should say, <laughs> my interest in historian only grew out of the movement. And what I know uh, from history, I've been taught by the movement. So in a way it's, it's giving back what I've learned. And, you know, I think of ACT UP in Boston where I was with, associated with a wonderful public health nurse who was an activist in ACT UP in Boston. There, we painted on the sidewalks, silence equals death. This was a great rallying cry that came out of the ACT UP struggle, the AIDS coalition to unleash power. And it began to give us power to stop our silence and to speak. <clears throat> and there's a second methodological principle that arose out of that struggle that has influenced me as a historian, and I'm not quite sure how it works with the current pandemic, which, which is still unspooling. And that methodological principle in history, we call history from below, but I think, um, Perhaps in this context, we need to think that the solution arises among the afflicted. 
that this is what brought about the the assault on the CDC. This is what forced the FDA to, this is what forced the pharmaceutical companies to develop and to search for uh, cures to HIV AIDS. It was the direct action of the afflicted and of the, of the grieving. The, and that suffering is not just a victimization, but produced a, a type of agency, which now we are searching for again. And what form it will take, uh, we're, we're still wondering. Um, I'm just trying to look at my time to see whether I've done enough, but maybe just those two principles I'd like to, to put forth. Uh, first, that the solution is within the afflicted communities. And uh, secondly, that we can't think of microparasites with, without also thinking of the macro parasites that that transmit them. That's Thank you very much, Dr. Linebaugh. Uh, cool. Um, great. So we're going to do some Q and A. I've got some Qs. Our panelists have some As. If you at home have a Q, go ahead and uh, message it in chat or comment on a video. We're going to talk for about forty minutes and then turn to questions from the audience. So if you got those questions, please submit them so I have something to ask. Uh, I want to dovetail off uh, uh, Dr. Linebaugh's comments about history, taking the millennial view. Um, but here's our first question. Pandemics and health crises aren't new. So what are some examples of past ep epidemics, including, but not limited to, the HIV AIDS crisis of the 80s, that can help us make sense of what's going on right now? How have ep epidemics been used by those in power or those oppressed to advance their causes? If someone raises their hand, I'll call on them. We're going to do it now. Uh, Mr. Kinsman, here you go. Yeah, so, I mean, I think they're used very differentially by those in positions of power and those who are oppressed. Um, and I think from, from the top down, they're actually used obviously to divide people, um, to get rid of people who are considered to be expendable, to reconstruct the social world in relationship to capitalism, race and racialism, patriarchal relations, and so on. But I think what I'm most interested in right now, and I understand the particular context in the US and the context in Canada is slightly different and the context in other countries is slightly different. Um, and obviously there needs to be a relationship to electoral politics, but it seems to me that what's really important is what, what was just mentioned by Peter, which is the solutions coming from the bottom up, uh, the solutions that have to do with health from below, that have to do with people claiming more control over their bodies and lives and organizing in ways that actually improve access to healthcare, like healthcare for all in the United States, but that's also a question in all sorts of other places as well, uh, access to treatments. We need to make sure that the agenda for treatments, vaccines and so on in the context of COVID-19 is not defined by the profit motivations of the pharmaceutical corporations, but it's actually defined by the needs of people. Um, in the context of the AIDS crisis, one of the interesting things were community-based research initiatives that actually did a lot of work around treatment, sometimes effectively, sometimes not. But we actually need to focus on a different type of treatment politics in the current context, which has largely been ignored. I mean, no one's actually, because of the public health framing of everything, no one's really been terribly focused on the survival and the lives of those people who are already infected, who are likely to be most susceptible to death. So these are just some of the things, but I think it's really important for us to understand that we need to use um, our responses from below and that we need to resist these efforts from above that are designed to weaken our movements and our capacities and are designed to, to reorganize the social world much more in the interests of neoliberal capitalism. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think I saw a hand from Dr. Dryden. Is that hand still up? Hell yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Mic. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think we can learn a lot from Typhoid Mary, Mary Mellon, and the ways in which typhoid was responded to and how public health uh, developed around her and the um, very early on um, how public health, uh, this outbreak, 
this, um, this disease, this virus that was being transmitted was met with surveillance, incarceration, um, uh, a racialization as well. Uh, 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 this idea that the neighbors should turn in the people who are sick, this, this belief that somehow if you are infected um, or have the possibility of infecting others, then you should be, you know, put in um, uh, incarcerated in particular ways. And so we, you know, um, many scholars have done some excellent work around just documenting that history of Typhoid Mary. But then if we look to the ways in which um, blackness and black people are often um, science into degradation, then we can see how medicine and science have worked to try to get us to believe that there are such things as races and that um, because we have these different scientific biomedical races, then we have different levels of, you know, who gets to be healthy, who gets to be human, um, who has the right to care. And so all of those things, you know, I do my work in blood and blood donation. And so even how we understand uh, AIDS and HIV as being, you know, endemic to Africa, this country, <laughs> the way it's framed as a country, and that um, this blood is, um, is just is poisonous as, as are its people. And so, uh, you know, I, I, this point that Gary made in terms of this public health or um, universal health care, we really need to look at the experiences, for example, in Nova Scotia, where, um, you know, six, you know, there's under a million people in Nova Scotia, 900 and change in the entire province. And around 70,000 people don't have a primary care physician. Um, many African Nova Scotians and black people live rurally, which means that, um, you know, you, you, you don't have a doctor. So what do you do for care? Um, often, there are times where we see emergency rooms closed at night because there's not enough physicians to staff the emergency rooms. And so this idea of universal care really needs to be um, critiqued because um, uh, it's not universally available to everyone who needs care. Um, uh, and not to mention that there's not a universal pharmacare uh, uh, policy or practice or program in place. And so and we're also in a, in a country that refuses to collect disaggregated race-based data. Um, not that, you know, we've seen it collected in the United States and we still see these huge swaths of health disparities. Um, but the, the practice that we hear now is, you know, especially from premiers of many provinces and chief medical officers of many provinces, now is not the time to deal with health, health equity. Now is not the time to deal with the social determinants of health. Now is not the time to collect the race-based disaggregated data. Um, and not that that's the be all and end all, but it operates as a form of harm reduction. So um, the negotiations and the kind of interventions that need to be made on the provincial level and then throughout various cities, um, it, it provides us a, a tool to do that, this disaggregated race-based um, race -based data. And so when we look at the ways in which, for example, the Black Panther Party um, put together health clinics in the late 60s, right, in Oakland, um, we see how some of this continues to happen today uh, in Nova Scotia, as I mentioned, where doctors understand their roles as activists, not simply adv advocates, but as activists um, to demand and call on and insist um, that Black people um, have an opportunity to live healthy lives um, with the supports we need in which to do that. Uh, the steady jobs, <laughs> uh, steady incomes, at not, you know, not living in food de deserts, not being you know, underhoused, um, having access to clean water. Uh, and so uh, these are just some of the historical snippets, if you will, um, that uh, had effective interventions that we see rolling out now. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I saw a hand from Dr. Leinbaugh. Was that still eligible? Yeah, I was going to add um, that following the 1918-1919 influenza epidemic, there were some, uh, we need to see that in a historical context <laughs> 
of the Bolshevik Revolution the year before, the intervention by the USA, the UK to destroy the communist project in 1918 and 1919, the same time as the influenza epidemic. This was, I'm speaking of the growth of the KKK. I'm speaking of the, uh, the formation of the Nazis. I'm speaking of reactions, I think, that were formed by the fears and anxieties of the so-called Spanish flu at the time of this, which was a result of the war, of course, epidemiologically. But the rise of the an anti-colonial struggle in India, in Kenya, in Belize, the hope for trade unionists and workers, the IWW, the met a vicious white supremacist repression that colored the world in the 1920s. And that I think that the discussion now often goes back to the, that period of 1918, 1919, just because of the flu. But we need to remember it was followed by this very severe reaction, racist, homophobic, patriarchal. Great, so absolutely. In other words, to wrap things up, I think that the, an aspect of these diseases is not just, is not just material, but it's also emotional and spiritual. It's, it also has this other component to it, which is very, that can well influence the cultural and political life uh, subsequent uh, to the crisis. And I think uh, this is part of our future now. So uh, I think I agree very much with Gary's view that we must take the offensive, but in, in doing so, we need really to be very careful, very, uh, I think uh, L.A. Kaufman used the term honest. We had to be honest with ourselves. So this is a danger I'm, I'm, I'm trying to signal from 1918. Thank you very much. And rounding it out, let's hear from Ms. Kaufman. Um, thanks, uh, Timothy. Yeah, uh, to build on that, I want I, I want to uh, return to this idea of the the responses from below, um, the solutions from the most impacted, um, and I want to raise a cautionary note, which is um, to have us think about the distinction between mutual aid, which is a form of direct action, and volunteerism, which is not. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a team of scholars who've been tracking a public protest um, ever since Donald Trump took office, uh, led by Erica Chenoweth um, from Harvard University. And they have a taxonomy that they developed of collective action in the time of COVID. And they, they've come up with a taxonomy of like 100 different forms of collective action. And I look at them and some of them, you know, there's a distinction to be made. Um, I think Dr. Dryden was pointed by, by invoking the idea of the Black Panthers, uh, the, you know, the breakfast programs and the health clinics that the Black Panthers established, um, uh, much like uh, many other radical uh, mutual aid projects. They don't just, they, yes, they offer a direct solution to a problem, but they do so in a way that embodies and encapsulates a sharp critique of the existing order and that calls for institutional change. They are not sufficient. It is, we are not, you know, um, so in this taxonomy that, uh, that Professor Chenoweth and, and, and company have put together, you know, there's all these measures that people have taken that are forms of collective action, like sewing masks. I've, I've done my share of that, right? But there's a difference between when we're taking our scraps of, of elastic and fabric that we can find to sew masks for our, our neighbors to, to, to be stopgap PPE. There's a difference between doing that as a purely volunteeristic um, kind of charity work um, and doing it 
um, in, in a way that's accompanied by a critique of what a shocking failure uh, our institutions um, have shown by failing to have personal protective equipment and face coverings for essential and frontline workers, um, and particularly for those who are most vulnerable. Um, so when we think about the solutions from below, um, uh, I think it's important. It's been um, really heartening to see how many mutual aid projects have emerged, but mutual aid is not enough. Mutual aid has to be a beacon that is pointed as shining a light on the institutional failures that rendered it necessary. And that is somehow, and I and those somehows are very challenging in this moment, but that is somehow tied to a kind of collective action that is seeking profound institutional change. I saw another hand from uh, Dr. Dryden. Oh, you're still on mute. I'm usually better than that. My apologies. So I wanted to add on to what L.A. Kaufman was speaking about. I think um, there's a way that respectability gets caught up into pandemics, right? And this kind of moralism and um, morality and uh, value where, you know, and we see it, right? We see it on... Um, online platforms, hookup platforms, right? Like, are you clean or, you know, are you disease free? Like these things that somehow um, uh, having a virus or being infected by a virus um, signals um, some form of immorality or some kind of, you know, a disrespectful position. And so I mentioned this as well, because um, the idea that there's, the other part that goes with respectability is this idea that we need to be included in the system as it currently exists. And if we're included in the system as it currently exists, then it means that somehow um, we, we will be afforded the same kind of opportunities that, um, you know, that white supremacy generally gives to white people. Um, and so where these mutual aid pieces are happening, whether it's you know collecting funds to disperse amongst folks that aren't um, eligible for the government funds that are available, or um, uh, setting up um, anti-racist or BIPOC care mongering online sites, there also needs to be this kind of claim to um, uh, to all things that are not respectable <laughs> um, uh, as a way to disrupt this idea that there's only, um, that the population, uh, that the only population we need to worry about are those who are victims by those who aren't doing the right thing. And so we see uh, in Nova Scotia and other places where black people are named and outed as being, unre um, being dangerous and uh, not following uh, the, the physical distancing or not following the public health um, states of emergency, and it's because that they are not following these things that they are now the danger. They are now the vectors and the carriers that are bringing the the disease, you know, to predominantly white communities. And um, uh, this push to be like, you know, we need to name uh, the postal codes of uh, sites of clusters so we know who who those codes are. And I think you know uh, we need to. to we, we need to not do that for a variety of reasons, but we also need to step into this place of the odd, the queer, if you will, um, the non-normative, as, 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 and to center that to be able to think differently about the kinds of interventions that are needed and required, um, not only during the pandemic and all the things that pandemic has re revealed and made more evident, but post the pandemic. Right, and whatever the new situation, if it will even be new, um, we need to really kind of step into the non normative, um, the thing that's just a bit too far to fully imagine, the thing that doesn't sit neatly as, as a way to um, demand uh, and create for ourselves, but also demand um, a, a different response and uh, different opportunities, a, a different availability. Great. Well, uh, we've 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 kind of talked about this topic a, a few times across all y'all. Um, going on the offensive, talking about uh, fighting for what happens after the coronavirus, solutions from below, how mutual aid isn't necessarily enough. So let's talk about what we should do. 
So how has resistance changed or adapted during this crisis and what still need to change? And what does solidarity mean in a time of physical distance? Ms. Coffin? Um, I mean, it's really too early to answer that question in any definitive way. This has been, we're still in a very early experimental phase of response and um, and people are um, are traumatized and sheltering at home. Um, it, you know, there's all kinds of factors that are limiting collective response. So um, so it's early, and that um, you know that somewhat discouraging uh, comment I made earlier about like remembering that it took ACT UP a while. There's a there's a flip side to that as well, which is that we have time still to think and to innovate. Um, you know, one thing that, that jumps out at me, of course, is that uh, the, the economic uh, dislocations that have happened um, as a result of this pandemic have given certain categories of exploited, undervalued workers greater leverage than they had in the past. And so, um, so we are seeing the classic tool of the strike or the withdrawal of consent, the withdrawal of labor, the withdrawal of participation um, has an added power in some sectors right now. Um, and so uh, the organizing that has been taking place, for, for instance, among Amazon workers um, is extremely important and extremely important in its own right, um, but also extremely important as a model of collective power in this time. Um, but I think we don't know yet um, what forms of powerful disruptive action are going to be possible in this era for those who are not in those strategic positions. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, to go back to that, that contrast I cited earlier of, you know, we had a period in the early um, period of the Trump administration where we had more street protests than at any prior time in U.S. history. And then right now, who's out on the streets um, having large protests? It's the anti-lockdown protests um, that have been uh, you know, encouraged tacitly by Trump and that have been organized by a whole variety of uh, far-right um, organizations, um, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, there's really nowhere else in the world where that is happening in the way that it is in the U.S. Um, there are, there have been, there was a, uh, there was an anti-lock down protest in Stuttgart uh, the day before yesterday that drew 5,000 people um, that's associated with the far right in Germany. There've been one or two others. Um, there've been, you know, a, han there's a handful of smaller actions in the UK. Um, of course, um, Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil has been encouraging um, uh, protests against state um, uh, lockdown orders, um, but that's a somewhat different dynamic. Um, uh, I, you know, I think, uh, we can, you know, of course, people can do their Twitter storms and they can do phone jams and there's, you know, all kinds of tactics that are available to people, but we haven't really figured this one out yet. We haven't figured out, you know, I mean, I have nothing but praise and respect for the folks I know, again, some of these folks who are, act, you know, who are living in their second pandemic, folks I know in New York who've been out doing banner actions um, in front of some of the hardest hit hospitals and some in front of some of the big morgues, um, you know, in this landscape of death that is the landscape of New York City now, um, doing these powerful, visually powerful, socially distanced banner actions. Um, but those are intrinsically, um, do not have the disruptive power that is necessary for direct action to actually catalyze lasting change. Um, so I think, uh, we're in a, a moment where we need to be, um, sitting deeply with those questions, looking widely, um, for possibilities, um, and, uh, and and recognizing 
um, that um, it's it's almost like having a disability mindset. You know, I, I'm disabled. When you're disabled, you you're constantly thinking about how you have to adapt. The thing, there's things that you can't do, and so you come up with workarounds. And it's it's almost as if we have to have that kind of disability justice framework for thinking about direct action in this time. Thank you very much. I saw a hand from uh, Mr. Kinsman. Uh, yes. Um, thanks for the, for those comments. Um, I guess I I want to talk about one thing in particular and connect it to the question we were asked. Um, I do think it's important for us to understand that there are these right wing fascist mobilizations going on uh, in the Canadian context. I don't think they've managed to attract more than fifty people, and they've not got the same media attention as in the U.S. But I mean, these are going to be happening globally, and in some ways, they're ways of pushing forward the reopen the economy position coming from people like Trump and sections of the capitalist class and certainly uh, some sections of the Conservative Party in Canada and so on. That's not really what I wanted to focus on. What I wanted to focus on was one thing that's very different from the AIDS crisis, um, which is that because of the way in which the pandemic has emerged, it's actually the authority of public health officials that people are largely relying on which has an awful lot of problems to it. In the context of the AIDS HIV crisis, we were actually develop, able to develop safe sex, safe practices from the bottom up. Um, but now we actually are sort of forced to rely on public health officials. And there's lots of problems with what they suggest. And I think one of the weaknesses of our response has been not doing popular education and, and community organizing around these issues, which I know is difficult, but it has to be done. So for instance, they say social distancing. Well, we actually need the social far more than ever right now. The question is the character of that social, um, which we need to, to organize around. But we also need to talk about things in terms of physical distancing, which is what people are actually need to do, right? And we need to organize that from the bottom up and provide support for people to do that. So for instance, when they say stay at home, um, in the Canadian context anyway, I'm not sure how much that plays south of the border, um, Homeless people can't stay at home. The home is actually a dangerous place for lots of people, including lots of women, uh, queer and trans youth and other people. Uh, there's lots of people who also don't have homes who are in institutions who are in very, very dangerous situations. And even though some people in long-term care facilities might refer to them as their homes, they're actually in a very precarious situation. And I think we actually need to challenge the public-private divide. We need to actually organize for public spaces that are available for people to engage safely in physical distancing. But the way in which it's been organized so far is to sort of try to push people back into the private realm, which is supposedly identified with safety. So that raises a whole series of questions. But what it means for us is I think we have to link solidarity um, in the context of COVID-19 with community organizing, popular education that actually supports people engaging in physical distancing. Um, I hope that makes some sense to people. And that's what I, what I think would give much more real material, social, cultural context and content uh, to what we talk about in terms of physical distancing. These are not individual practices. They need to become social and collective practices and be linked into notions of social solidarity. So those mutual aid networks need to actually become part of the vehicles through which from the bottom up, we're doing some of this work. Um, so I think that's the main point I wanted to say, and I've gone on for long enough, so I will shut up. Thank you very much. Um, great, great points all around. I think, uh, man, we could have an entire another hour and a half conversation about pu public health and what, the, what public means in the public health framework and how that's defined. Uh, but one thing we can't not talk about is HIV, AIDS, and ACT UP. So here's a question about that. Some of the most vibrant activism in the last half century came in response to the HIV, AIDS epidemic in the face of great indifference from the state and much of the medical establishment. What lessons should be brought to bear from the struggles of groups like ACT UP to the coronavirus? Mr. Kinsman? I did notice that, that um, Peter wanted to talk about the last question. Um, so I don't know how you want to deal with that because I'd certainly be interested in hearing what he has to say. But oh, just, um, sorry about that. Do you want to do that and then come yeah, back? Yeah, let's do that. Question? Okay. Sorry, I, I, I have four windows open and I, I'm missing some of, the, some of the hands that go up. Dr. Leinbaugh, uh, mic's to you. Yeah, I thank you, Gary. 
uh, I had my hand, hand up only because I, I wanted to say, I'm wondering what, what is an essential worker? What, what work is now essential? And the work that's essential is to look after one another, it's the nursing, it's the doctors, it's the health. And I think even now the highest reaches of uh, power have been forced to use this expression, the essential worker. And I believe th this might be a starting point for us, that it refers to the whole realm of who's looking after us. Who are the homemakers, the parents? So this nursing, and to me, it goes right back to, seven, to the formation of the USA and the UK, which were, which were formed to privatize. The USA was formed in the midst of the yellow fever epidemic, when settlers were drunk with, with whiskey. And the people who nursed and buried the dead were Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. These were former slaves who provided the essential labor in 1793, 1794, and the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, perhaps the most long-standing mutual aid society in the USA or I said the USA, I should say Turtle Island. Anyway, that's Gary, that's all I wanted to, to say is that the question of who and what is essential has been raised. Great, thank you very much. And I, I, I saw a hand from LA. Um, yeah, well, the, the flip side of uh, what Peter Leinbaugh was just talking about of essential workers, I think immediately of the title of David Graeber's most recent book, Bullshit Jobs. Mm -hmm. Part of what this time is revealing to us is how many jobs are bullshit jobs, that the flip side of the essential work is all the inessential work that has been um, part of this um, planet destroying stage of capitalism. And, um, uh, you know, when, when we think about, um, you know, openings for creative rethinking in this time, um, certainly as people um, talk about uh, with, with uh, as, as ideas of, of universal basic income grow greater currency, um, and as we think about all of those kinds of, of care work, um, as people are turning to raising their own, planning to raise their own food this season to a greater degree, and we're thinking of a, you know, a different kind of home economy, um, uh, I, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be starrily optimistic about it, but um, I think this has thrown into relief how many jobs are in fact fundamentally not just inessential, but harmful to, um, to life and the planet. Um, on, on the question you raised about um, the lessons from ACT UP and the lessons of organizing, and going in a little, we, we've talked about that a fair bit, but going in a tangent from the mutual aid, one thing that's really striking to me about the mutual aid pods that people have been setting up is the way in which even in this socially distanced moment, um, people in many communities are connecting with their physical neighbors to a degree that they had not done, where, um, you know, people, we, whether they're setting up like a little WhatsApp group or they're going around and they're putting pieces of paper under the door and creating these mutual aid pods, they, um, it's, it is an infrastructure, you know, for all the, the, the insufficiencies I pointed to early on on, on uh, mutual aid that, that's purely voluntaristic, it's interesting to think about these new relationships that people are forming and how those could be part of uh, a robust collective response to all of the enormous challenges of this moment. Um, I can't think, you know, people, yeah, there's been, you know, a, 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 um, a, a, a turn to um, door knocking and uh, intellectual work 
over the last uh, two to four years that we hadn't seen a degree since the early 70s. But this is different. This is a deeper kind of relationship than people going on doors and saying, well, you vote for so-and-so. It, it's And um, those new social relations, I think, could be interesting components of a collective response. Absolutely. I think I saw a hand from Gary. Yeah, and I'm sort of going to do a, a, an answer that sort of deals with some of the questions that have been circulating. Um, I, I think that this focus on neighborhood community organizing is really crucial, even though it's very difficult to do now. It actually grounds our organizing in different ways um, and that I think are really important to build on. Around the question of essential, I wanted to sort of talk about the two sides of that, because I think on the one hand, there is the recognition that the, the work that cleaners do, the work that um, grocery store workers do should actually be considered essential. Now that will disappear really soon after this uh, pandemic is over and we have to, to remember that and not allow it to disappear. But the other thing is the way in which essential is being used to push forward uh, certain types of projects in a situation in which it's much harder for us to resist them. Uh, so in, in particularly in the Canadian context, that's that has to do with the fossil fuel industry, with various pipelines that are being opposed by Indigenous people. So some essential work is actually essential work, not because it's essential for our lives and our survival. It's essential to the needs of capital accumulation and resource extraction capitalism. And I think we need to be quite, we need to remember that and we need to be quite opposed to how that's currently being deployed in the context of this crisis and instead to talk about the need of labor that has to do with caring and social reproduction um, actually being at the center of our social worlds in terms of um, things to learn from AIDS activism I think we've we've talked about a lot of those and I think um, it's really important for us to return to the roots of AIDS activism rather than state managed and state funding forms of AIDS uh, groups because aid service organizations, as they're often caused, uh, called, don't remember any of that. They don't embody any of those acquisitions from AIDS activism. So it really means returning to the organizing that was going on in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, some of the work that the ACT UP Oral History Project has recorded, some of the work in the Canadian context that the AIDS Activist History Project has been recording. So it's those stories that we actually need to hear from and listen to in this context and not the sort of mainstream history um, that's embodied within some of the official accounts of what happened around AIDS. So, because I mean, AIDS has also been something on the other side of it that ended up being very successfully managed by state and professional and pharmaceutical um, corporations um, to actually tame it and limit it and to actually turn aid service organizations in many ways into groups that actually weren't very helpful to people living with AIDS and HIV, especially to many communities of people affected by AIDS and HIV. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else before we go to audience questions? Great, cool. As I said, I've got like four windows open, so it's hard to see everybody at once. I'm gonna ask one audience question. This comes from Jesse on YouTube. Uh, what do you imagine as examples of community-based education about care and treatment that might be possible now? What could that look like? How should we go about imagining other possibilities of care? Gary? Just say something briefly about that. I'm involved with a group that's sometimes called policing the pandemic or how you can't police your way out of a pandemic, which involves lots of different people who are involved in various different communities and activism and doing research that's opposed to the way in which uh, people are now being criminalized both through public health measures as they lead into policing but also through police measures that are obviously affecting homeless people um, indigenous people uh, people of color um, poor people um, in much more direct ways than they affect um, people who are not in those positions of vulnerability um, one of the things we've been doing is actually producing um, info graphics that we send around through social media that also can be posters on like why you shouldn't call the police on your neighbors, for instance, things like that. But it seems to me that we actually need things like that about engaging in physical distancing, not from the top down, but actually like how it has a relationship to building social solidarity, how it's the way we actually all need to collectively be interacting 
right now. So I think we need posters, we need leaflets. It's not a question of us handing them out on the streets, but we need to figure out ways of getting them um, into uh, the, the reading material that people are actually going to be reading. So I think those are some of the ways we need to do it. Um, but we also, we need to just talk to people in the ways in which we can about why physical distancing um, is absolutely crucial um, and how we need to have social space, including public social space, to be able to do that. Uh, so it also means like responding to some of the concerns of people who say, well, why can't I go for a walk, right? It's a completely legitimate concern, right? But we need space to be able to do that um, in, um, in safe ways. It also means, for instance, and I know this has happened in some places, that, that we need to organize against car culture, right? Cars and the streets that they're on sometimes actually need to be taken over by people so that we can engage in safe distancing practices, right? Um, anyway, I just, I'll leave it there again, but I think those are really important ideas, but we need to connect mutual aid with popular education, with community organizing and an anti-capitalist, uh, anti-oppression type of approach. And that's a difficult task, but I think some of the trends that we're seeing actually begin to, to pull some of that together. Thanks. Thank you. Fantastic. I saw a hand from Dr. Dryden. Hi, thank you. Omi Shire. So uh, one of the things, some of the, there's many things I agree with Gary. There's lots of ways in which we've already seen this kind of popular education happening. And so in African Nova Scotian communities and black communities, um, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, like January, February, um, people were already going door to door and talking to people about what the pandemic would mean. This was before the states of emergency or the state of emergency here in Nova Scotia. Um, and so finding out um, the kinds of supports that were needed in um, people who were living in multi-generational homes, that kind of thing, and really Act, being activists around making sure that there were public health supports um, in the community in various communities. So if there needed to be testing that that was happening, um, if there needed to be um, some kind of support in terms of self isolating within homes that were already um, where people were already under housed, like providing supports for that to happen. Um, and at the same time, though, uh, uh, making sure that there was a version of cop watch that could happen. Uh, so especially for folks in rural communities where they could, yes, go out for a walk. They might not, you know, you're under house, you wanna go, you wanna go out for a walk, you wanna do things, you know, you need to get away from, you know, uh, just get some space. And so what kind of cop watch could be put into place so that you weren't then being over surveilled while you were going out for a walk. And as Gary said, you know, uh, some of the work that's happened around police and pandemic um, also, you know, really started early on in Nova Scotia in terms of documenting when that was happening and making sure that people had a voice for that. And then um, uh, really spending some time talking with community members around the usefulness of face masks right? So wearing a mask, making sure that they were funky and fly, um, but also um, yet an, some more education around what does it mean to be Black people wearing masks and going into a store or, you know, walking down the street or doing these kinds of things uh, where we're already uh, surveilled. And as I said earlier, um, uh, BIPOC and anti-racist care mongering sites where people could organize around food shares. Um, I know in Toronto there was um, a food share, uh, food share, good box, food share pieces that were already in place, but then kick that up to make sure that people um, who, who lost their jobs, so many of us lost their jobs, um, still had access to some income. And then the kind of work that, uh, and, and food, and then the kind of work that went into canceling rent and making sure that people didn't get um, kicked out of their homes um, because they didn't have the funds to, to pay rent. So a lot of this grassroots, and I'm gonna call it grassroots, on the ground, you know, phone calls, what do you need? How are we gonna do this? You know, hop in the car, drop stuff off, check in. You know, um, I know some people call 
uh, like Skype into other people's homes as a way to try and engage children so single parents can have, you know, a bit of a break or feel supported. Like these are the kinds of things um, that I call grassroots that have um, really sprung up and, and were in existence became more in existence, and I hope will continue to be in existence um, once some of these um, states of emergency are relaxed or ended. Great, fantastic. We have uh, 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna jump ahead to our last question. It's a real softball. Um, lastly, we've all, got a lot of, we've all got a lot of time on our hands. What books or other works would you recommend right now, whether to inspire hope, educate, or entertain? Let's go with Peter. Well, people are thinking positively. I would say here's a book to avoid. Uh, this, this is the, <laughs> the first novel of the USA. It's called Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown. And it is so opaque and discouraging and pessimistic, but it's a description of Philadelphia when Alexander Hamilton fled town and so did uh, George Washington because they were so frightened of catching the yellow fever and meeting up with uh, runaway slaves, uh, refugees from Haiti. Yeah, so this, this, this is a novel right at the time at the birth of the USA, which, which again, I think is, uh, is past its sell-by date. And earlier when um, LA was talking about mutual aid showing a beacon of light upon the institutions that are no longer serving us, I would say I would include the USA in that. Here's an institution that is no longer serviceable. In fact, it's being used against us in its federalism. And it's time that we dreamt up something new. It's a good dream. Next up, uh, I see LA. Oops, I was muted. Um, uh, in uh, the public education vein, um, I would love to, first of all, I would love to see some of those um, posters, um, Gary, that you were mentioning um, that Policing the Pandemic has produced. Um, and uh, I think it makes me think a lot about the agitprop of ACT UP, which was one of its most powerful interventions. So um, if you can find it somewhere, it's no longer in print. Hang on, I don't have it all the way on the screen. Um, AIDS Demographics. Um, which is this wonderful book um, edited by um, Douglas Crimp with Adam Rolston that came out that is a compilation of some of the best uh, graphic design work that uh, ACT UP did um, with its uh, wheat pasting and stickering and postering campaigns. Um, uh, and it also uh, has a wonderful cultural analysis of how and why these interventions were so powerful and disruptive. Great recommendation, thank you very much. All right, let's take it to Gary. Um, yeah, one, one thing is, first of all, I wanted to take up an assumption in the question around people who have lots of time on their hands. Um, I think that's only for some people. Um, I think for homeless people, for lots of people in various different communities, they're in survival mode. They're actually doing things all the time and they don't actually have a lot of time for reading. So I think we need to think about the sort of class social basis of the assumption that when people are at home, they're also not doing lots of work. And of course, there's many people who don't have homes and are having survival work outside that context. But also remember that being at home, you know, e even though it's, you know, a different way of living and way of doing work for some people is also a site of work in terms of caring social reproduction labor that is often assigned uh, to women, both cis and trans uh, women. Um, and I think that that's important. In terms of, in terms of things to read, I, I really agree with what L.A. Kaufman just suggested. If you can find that book around, it is really important. I will try to see if I can get um, through the publishers uh, some of the stuff from Policing the Pandemic. I don't have access to it uh, right now. In terms of books, I think I don't want to mention particular books. I mean, I could mention um, Sick of the System, which is coming out next Monday, but that's just a shameless plug. So I won't say anything more about that. Um, but I think that we need to be reading, you know, anti-racist work, um, climate justice work, 
um, anti-capitalist work. Uh, we need to be recovering the histories of various groups of people who've engaged in this, but I also want to put in a plug for utopian and maybe science fiction type materials. I mean, there's, there's numerous people that people could be looking at there because I think this is actually a time to open up thinking about alternatives to the current order that we find ourselves in. And sometimes um, that can be found in nonfiction, but sometimes fiction can actually be a really useful way of conveying that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gary. And uh, thanks for the call on. That's a really good point. Last up, let me share. Hi. Um, oh my gosh, why do you ask us to name books? There's gonna be people we forget. And then we're gonna get the text messages or they're gonna like shade us on Twitter. Um, so I agree with all of the pieces that were offered. I also wanna offer Alondra Nelson's book, Body and Soul, which has been out for a minute, but talks about Black Panther Party and the fight against medical discrimination, um, which is so important right now. My colleague's book, Ingrid Waldron's book, There's Something in the Water. Um, Until We Are Free, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, Black, the Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. Um, and uh, Octavia Butler, every day, all the time, every moment that you could possibly do that. My apologies to everybody whose book I that's suddenly gone out of my head that I have forgotten. And um, of course, everybody's books here. Um, for those who have time to read, which will be in the wee hours of the morning as we try to quiet our minds and heal our souls as we try to get some sleep. Um, that's what I would offer right now. Thank you very much. All right, we are at 626 in East Coast time. My primary responsibility as a moderator is make sure we get out on time. So welcome to the end of the panel. Um, this here's a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, you can check out the hashtag Radical Mate uh, campaign. You can check out a varied multilingual program of roundtables, talks, and debates about the ideas that will transform the world to come at radicalmay.literalbcn.cat. You can sign up for the PM Press newsletter at pmpress.org to hear more about events like this one and their forthcoming cross-publisher panel with a radical guide, Verso and Haymarket, titled Mutual Aid, Building Communities of Care in Times of Coronavirus and Beyond on May 21st, with guests including uh, Kalia Kuno, Dean Spade, Mary Amikaba, and Klee, uh, Benoli, and more. You can support radical publishers and panelists. Once again, Dr. Omishre Ardiden, uh, Gary Kinsman, L.A. Kaufman, and Peter Leinbaum. And thanks again to our sponsors, Between the Lines, Verso, Melville House, PM Press, and a radical guide. 627, I've made it. Uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for watching our panel. Thank you. <laughs>